On this video, I'm taking a look at the new two-player game from Lookout Glasgow. Completely out of the blue, don't know much about it when it first came out. Question is, is it any good? And do I feel I can break stone on this guy's rock-solid chin? Hi, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple, and if you're new to this channel, then stay tuned if you are new to games and want to learn more about them and the people who play them. Glasgow is a two-player game that for me just came right out of the blue. Didn't see it coming, didn't know anything about it, it just suddenly appeared. Glasgow, look out games. And that normally gets me a little excited, not necessarily because of Glasgow, although I have been there, it's a nice city once you get inside it, but more the fact that it's Lookout games. Lookout games and Cosmos games tend to be the the two publishers that tend to get a lot of these two-player games out, and for the most part, they do a pretty good job of it. In Glasgow, you are looking to contribute the most to building up the city. You have a ring of tiles that represent different architects that you can visit to gain resources and conduct special abilities. The idea is that you are building a city grid of 4x5 tiles in the middle, and you move around this ring of architects, collecting resources, converting them into what you need, and using them in order to build city tiles that you will place in the middle and trigger special effects from factories or just gaining points from other buildings. Glasgow borrows its movement mechanic from games such as Patchwork and Takedo, where you can move as far as you like, but there is no specific turn sequence. Players take turns based on where the opponent is in relation to them. If the opponent is further ahead than them, then it's the other player's turn, and they can take actions as many times as they like, providing they don't overtake the opponent. Once they do, then it becomes that player's turn, and it continues on in this fashion. No specific rounds, no specific turn sequence, it's just a case of keep moving, keep moving until the end game is triggered. Different buildings will score points for players in different ways, but the most intriguing of all is the factory tiles. They don't score you many points, but they can generate resources for you. Every time a building is placed in the city, you have to check the column and the row that it's in. Any factory tiles, regardless of ownership, trigger and grant resources to the various players. So as well as trying to be efficient at gathering resources with the architects, you're also trying to place factories and buildings in such a way in the city grid, with the restriction that it must be a 4x5 grid, in such a way that they will score the most points for you, trigger the factories the most for you, and of course hinder the opponent. Once the city is complete, the game's over, and of course, the one with the most victory points is the winner. Of course! I just can't let that meme die. So let's go into detail with duration first. It's a pretty good setup here. The game box claims 30 minutes, and that's pretty accurate. We're talking 45 minutes at the absolute max. If you're a little bit slow with the game, if it's your first time playing, or if you've got to teach it as well. But otherwise, 30 minutes is easily achievable. I basically spammed this game with a friend of mine several times in order to get it reviewed, and the first game took us about 40 to 45 minutes, because we were reading directly from the rule book, more on that later, and playing the game and checking it out. Then once we played it again and again and again, it took about 30 minutes per game, you know, to set it all up and get it sorted. Setup, in fact, probably takes longer than most of your turns in the game will, because you have to spend time making this circle of architect tiles, getting it in such a way that you can fit a 4x5 grid in there, then you've got to remove a couple of architect tiles, you've got to space them out in a certain way, so... There's a little bit of fiddliness with that at setup, certainly for a 30 minute game, but not too drastic. You are still talking a very short affair. Ease of play. How easy is the game to grok? Pretty straightforward. I mean, this is your rule book. It is basically a small paper thin little thing like that with barely about one page for setup and about four pages for rules, including the end game. And it's not particularly big. There's like, you know, fairly big text, a little text heavy, but you know, there's not a lot to read. It is a pretty straightforward affair at the end of the day. And that's a good thing. This one, I pretty much taught it from the rule book to myself and my friend. It took us 45 minutes to play, teach and set up the game and score up. And then after that, when we were more familiar with the rules, each game took about 30 minutes and I didn't really have to look at the rule book again apart from one, maybe two occasions where I had to just double check, oh wait, that's what that architect does? Ah, right. Because it's iconography everywhere. There's pretty much no text in the game, which is kind of ironic considering most of the text is in the rule book. But the idea is, is that you should be able to tell easily just from the pictures what each architect does. And for 90% of them, you can. 
most of them have just got the usual plus brick or the slash to say either or and most of them are like oh yeah I can kind of tell what they are they're pretty intuitive there's maybe about four or five symbols on the architects which reflect more specific abilities that you will need to look up in the rule book but once you know what they do you're not going to forget them pretty straightforward this is accessible to you know most gamers easily enough i'm not sure if i'd call it gateway level i suppose oh, actually, i don't know gateway level it could be that person would probably take a while to get used to the tactics involved in the game but to understand the rules no yeah, i'd say this is fairly gateway friendly tactics and strategy is there a lot to do on the mechanics solid are you thinking a lot is it quite a brain burner it's pretty straightforward for the most part, but there's a fair few paths you can follow. Most of this is done by the arrangement of the architects as well as the building types that there are. Some buildings want you to group them together for points, some want you to get a lot of the same buildings, some want to be in the corner, some are just straight up large points, some want you to get sets of buildings, some are the factories where, where do you position them? Are you going to put it in the line with other people's factories so that you can both get triggers, or are you going to just make your own really good row and column that only you have access to? There's multiple ways you can can play. Now whether you strategize to go for a particular type of building remains to be seen. You can only plan so far ahead because the architect building tiles that you use to actually build refresh quite frequently. So this is more of a tactical affair to say, right, well, how's the city developing? Which building would be good now? And unlike a lot of city building games I find, or a lot of two player games I find, there's a decent amount of emphasis on screwing the other player over. Now I don't mean anything too harsh, like I land on the space and I take your stuff, but you can't let your opponent run away with the types of buildings and, and architectiles that they need. You cannot share a space with another player. So if you know that they're looking to get this particular Particular architect to get a particular resource or an action then you might decide I just want to plug myself on there so that they've got to run past always a bit annoying but on top of that the building tiles that you can build those ones you have to be careful what your opponent is doing let's say for example they're going mad on parks the parks work on a squared scale so one is one point two is four points three is nine points etc so you can see how that quickly escalates to like stupid amounts of points if you're not careful. So if I'm playing against my friend who's doing that, I can't just let them get the parks. I might have to build one or two myself, or there is an architect and even a factory that allows you to just take an architect and scrap the building tiles that are on there. Great. You know, normally in most games, that's like, well, I don't care if I scrap the row. I mean, chances are I'll see something I want and I can't really mess up the opponent. Here you can. My friend actually not only used an architect tile in this way a lot, but also had a factory tile with the same ability that he used frequently, because in that game he was building a lot of factories, that was kind of his shtick, and constantly the building tiles that I wanted kept getting put away. It was somewhat frustrating. Ah, smug mode. But it was a good tactic by them. So you can't just ignore the opponent. Always a good thing, so this is definitely not just a solitaire game. However, the one slight issue with the movement mechanic, and this is the flaw in other games which use it, is that it can get a little bit formulaic. Because if you are behind the opponent and they go past you, that's one tension decision you've got to make. The idea of, right, I do I really need to get there first? Do I risk that the opponent's going to jump on there? Or do I skip a ton of spaces to go there? That's always good. The thing is, if you are the opponent and somebody runs past you, you have no reason to not go to almost every single architect before you get to the opponent. There's maybe one, two, three you'll find on route which use a specific action, so maybe you don't need the action, but a lot of the architects, probably a good 75% or more of them, will just be game resource. And so why would you not go to every single tile? So it gets a little bit predictable that as soon as my friend runs past me, I'm going to go, all right, well, brick, steel, gold, get, you, know, you don't even need to bother moving and putting them on the space. You just might as well just go to the reserve and pick up a bunch of resources that you need because why would you not? Now, you could argue that there is a storage mechanic where you have a player board and limited storage of different things, but other than the whiskey barrel, which is a wild resource that can get nicked, and the gold, which only lets you store free, I've never had a problem like storing resources. I mean, five, well, five stone, which is red for some reason. I don't know why the stone's red. Why didn't they just call it brick? But they've also got steel and gold. But I rarely, if ever, remember having storage issues. So it's kind of like a limitation I don't think the game needed. It's pretty difficult to amass resources in a huge stack without feeling, oh yeah, I could actually do with building these at some point. Probably my highlight is the city grid itself. 
4 by 5 you can build it from wherever, the first building isn't necessarily the center, and the positioning of the different building types as well as figuring out where am I going to put this factory, oh I'd like to put this building here but oh, I've got to give you a steal because it's going to trigger your factory, uh, that's annoying, so maybe I'll place it there instead but then you're waiting for the space, and which buildings am I going to build in general, there's a decent amount of decision making you're going to do and I like the idea of building up that city grid. Now in terms of aesthetics, it's not bad, I mean we are talking a cheap two player game here, but there's nothing like overly to speak of that's great. I mean your player board is pretty basic, you've got a fair amount of building tiles, but their design is kind of bland, they're lots of brown. I, I hope you like brown and grey a lot, because you're going to see a lot of that on these building tiles. You've got some, you know, decent wooden pieces here, although it's basically discs for gold and red for rectangles. I mean it's almost a bit like they cannibalise something out of their Agricola or Caverna game series. And then you've got the architects, which uh, have some okay artwork on there, nothing major, although like I said, some of their chins kind of look like you could smash stone on them, it's kind of odd. But one thing that is good is the graphic design. Even if the artwork is not particularly good, it is very easy to tell what the architect symbol is. You are never looking across the table going, hang on, what's that one do? No, it's pretty clear. All the buildings have got different artwork based on whether it's a landmark or a park or a tenement building. And even though the tenement building and a couple of landmarks are a little bit too similar in their look, I mean, it's basically just a building with a ton of windows, you know, what's the difference? But but some of them are a bit easier to tell at a distance and once you get the idea of what things score for what, because it's consistent along the range, you just look at the big star and see, oh that's three points for every, oh right that's a tenement building. But for the most part the graphic design is pretty solid. I just kind of wish that maybe the aesthetics were a little bit more colourful or maybe there was a little bit more, shall we say, appealing nature to it. Now I know the box says it's all about the 18th century restructuring but could we have not done it a little bit like later in the future and have more modern buildings? I don't know. If you've ever been to Glasgow, it's like penetrating the free rings. The outer ring as you go there on the train is like, I don't want to go anywhere near here, Ugh, I better watch myself. Then you get into this inner ring and it's like, oh, this is not too bad, it's alright, it's a bit better, but it's pretty industrial. There's like a football stadium and a lot of industry, so I wouldn't necessarily live here, but it's okay, it's fine. And then you get into the centre of Glasgow and it's almost like you stepped into another world. It's parked and a train station that looks like something like Platform 9 and 3 quarters. You've got all these cafes, you've got these rest art galleries, all the restaurants, uh, the, the various ex exhibit buildings, museums. The inner workings of Glasgow is pretty nice actually. It's a shame that the actual game doesn't look like that, it looks more like the other rings. I for immersion, is it engaging, is the theme represented well? The theme is non-existent here, it really doesn't matter. I mean you picked Glasgow as your title of the game. If you looked at this on a shelf, you would not even think twice about picking it up. If you scrolled through a bunch of st vertical storage games and you saw one called Glasgow, would you even take it off the shelf to look at it? And then on top of that, it doesn't really have anything to do with Glasgow. They've literally just gone, well this city got built up a lot in the 18th century, we'll go with it. They even tried to say that this ring of architects is the River Clyde. That's very unlikely. How? <laughs> Seriously? That is stretching the rubber band a little bit there, trying to get your theme into this game. Now, you are basically playing an abstract city builder. It could have been any city in the world, you could have just mixed and matched the different types of buildings, and the fact is, by choosing the 18th century of Glasgow, you're not exactly looking at the nicest looking buildings anyway. You end up with a 4x5 grid of basically tiles that score you points in different ways. They could have easily just been symbols, and it could have just been some like weird version of the Duke or Chess or or something. And you are still engaged in the game even though there's not a lot of theme because the downtime is pretty short. Doesn't matter how many actions the opponent's got after you've run past them, the actions are pretty quick. The longest action you will get in the game is building a tile and even then that's not difficult. For longevity, how well does it scale? Well it's two players, it scales with two players, but more importantly is there a lot of replay value? Not so much. The game doesn't feel that quintessentially different regardless of how you arrange that ring of tiles. Because there's a lot of architects you use but there's only two that are taken out of the game. And even when we had times where we took two that granted you the same resource, it didn't make that resource that much more difficult to acquire, you just had to do it by different means. But you don't really notice which two architect tiles are out of the board because it's two out of somewhere like 16 to 20 architect tiles that you're using. There's still quite a lot you use in every game. 
the buildings are all used as well. Yes, you may see them at different times and not every building may get seen depending on how often they get scrapped, but every building's in the pile. It's not like you take any out before the game or you have different sets of buildings that you can mix and match. Nah, it's essentially what you see is what you get, bar two architectiles. And without any other variants or anything else like that to speak of, it does mean that the replay value is a little bit limited. We pretty much played the hell out of this game when we were trying to test it out, but once we were done, we were kind of done. It's not that the game is not enjoyable, far from it, but I feel like I've got my fill of Glasgow and I'm kind of done with it for a while. I don't need to take it off the shelf anytime soon, but if somebody was to say, oh, do you want to have a game of Glasgow? I'd be like, yeah, I'll play it. It's decent, fun, and pretty easy to do, but it's not one that I feel somebody's going to play every single night, or it's certainly not going to measure up, say, against the stiff competition that you can get from, you know, Lookout's other two players, but even, say, like Cosmos two-player games, like Kahuna Lost Cities and... Imhotep the Duel and Targi, for example. There's a stiff major competition out there for two player only games, particularly in this small box format. And Glasgow, where it does actually measure up alongside them, is gonna struggle to stay on the shelf for as long as some of them. So my final word on Glasgow is that it is a neat two player game. It suffers mainly from some fairly bland aesthetics, lack of a theme, and a bit of a lack of replay value. But when you get into the game, it's nice and simple, doesn't take very long and does give you some meaningful decisions of what to do during the game. It basically is one of those things that it will sit alongside the competition but won't blow your mind or certainly won't take you to a, like, a different realm of two player games. No, it's another neat two player game which sadly hurts it slightly because in this day and age you kind of need to really bring your A game for this and Glasgow to me feels like a B game. It's a decent game, but I'm never going to be like, oh, Luke, what two-player games could you recommend? I could think of quite a few I'd think of as like A or A-plus games before I think of Glasgow. But again, if I see it in the library and I think I need to kill 20 to 30 minutes, you know what? Glasgow can come off the shelf and do me just fine. So Glasgow for me gets a respectable 7 out of 10. It's a neat two-player game. Easy to learn, quick to play, and gives you a decent amount of meaningful decisions, even if some of it can be formulaic, but you do have different ways to play each game. It is hindered, however, by some fairly bland aesthetics, a lack of any kind of immersive theme whatsoever, and of course, the replay value is going to mean that you're not likely to pull it off the shelf quite as often as other potential two players. So I hope you've enjoyed the content on this video, but I'm not the only person out there who's making board game content for you. There's a lot of other smaller channels that deserve your support, and I would like you to pay attention, please, to this one. Yo, what is up? This is Ninja Geek Games. Uh, thank you to Broken Meeple for providing the opportunity for small content creators like Ninja Geek Games to be recognised for the work we do. Um, Ninja Geek Games provides unboxing videos, playthroughs, learn to play videos and reviews for all sorts of games in multiplayer, solo, card games. Um, we thoroughly enjoy the work we do. We love interacting with gamers, designers, publishers through our media content. So please come and check us out across all platforms. That would be really, really great. Thank you. Cheers. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If I've earned your subscription, please click the avatar in the center to subscribe. Alternatively, you can check out the final part of my board game glossary video, or you can check out my recent mover and shaker series on Citadels. For now, remember, it's only a game.